One, two, three. Ah, yeah, you get dropped. This is the worst play. You got him, bro. Call him out. It's the yeah. interview. Motherfucker, what? Yes, yeah, yeah, get him off. He's seen. Here. That's right, that's right. 20 scene two. Yeah, that's right, 20 scene two. Interview time, yet again. Is that special time? And we got Admiral Crumple here. You know, Toronto rapper is doing it big, and he's here to rep his new CD coming out, Nightmare Fuel. Yeah. Yeah, so just a quick breakdown before we let Admiral Crumple take the floor here, tell you a little bit about himself. We're gonna talk about 20 C just quickly as we always do. You know what I'm saying? We are a collective, we are a Z collective, we are a website. We do a web series 20 C too, but go and check it all out at 20scene.com. You know what I'm saying? And, and like, you know, we, we distro scenes if we can. We, you know, put out any culture, Toronto music, and, and you know, art that we can. Lots of poetry and good stuff there, you know, and cartoon scenes and what have you. Get at you, boy. 20 official at gmail.com if you want anything, got any questions, anything like that. Uh, that said, you know, very stoked to have Admiral Crumple here. You know, t t tell them what it is. T tell them a little bit about you know, where you're coming from today, Admiral Crumple. Yeah, man. Doing? I'm just saying, excellent. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Man. Cool. Well, yeah, man. I'm excited to do this. And yeah, I'm just telling people, like, Check out Admiral Crumple on Spotify, you know, Dark Hard Club or Hip Hop since 2002. And it's like, you know what I'm saying? I'm just trying to get attention for this new album coming out, Nightmare Fuel. It's a grimy album. It's anti fucking escorts, anti cokeheads. It's There's a lot of truth in it. And it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's about healthy relationships. And if you're in a relationship, the things you deal with when you're in one. And then also just like, you know, the production's grimy as always and a lot of break beats this time and that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I tell you, it, it, Admiral Crumple just let me have a sneak peek on this album. So stoked to do that, but like, dude, that is some good shit, I'm telling you. Everybody check that, that out. Thank yeah. You, thank you. No, I'm not just saying that. Like, you know, we, we had we had we've covered artists like this before and and you know, Admiral Crumple's fucking just up the same alley, you know what I'm saying, same quality and all that, right? So I'm going to give you a quick breakdown here. Admiral Crumple, underground Toronto MC, got into rap in 1987, you know, it started rhyming, you know, more frequently around 1996 and still by, by that point, you know, no real recordings, that sort of thing, right? And so, you, you know, we have him here, we're, we're, we're chatting. You know, and and, and uh, Crumple released his, his first demo tape in 1999. This is years years later, right? So, uh, lots of experience here. And uh, when the, you know there was uh, uh, some that his demo tape there it was Panic Attack 1999, and, and since then up until 2002, Crumple managed to appear in 14 rap and hip hop projects. That, that same year, in 2002, the Admiral appeared on four radio uh, appearances four separate times and, and released his uh, a recorded album that same year. Big year, 2002, for Crumple. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, um, I want to say that researching Admiral Crumple, I found that, you know, we shared some goals as an artist and stuff like that as artists, uh, you know, uh, and that was like to expand with new exploits and, you know, avoid brackish stagnation as an artist, you know, like you, you can't get too complacent up in, in the art world and stuff like that, gotta stay relevant. And, and, and of course, yeah, I mean, to enjoy the spiritual connection that the artist, uh, you know, experiences through, you know, the works themselves, the world around them, the fans, everybody, right? The culture, right? And so uh, that brings me to my first question for you. Uh, what was it like at one of the first live shows where you appeared as uh, some sort of opening act, even a headline or something like that on the monkey? Yeah, I mean, my first show, like, uh, I went to, like, ECI. I went to uh, high school, like, but then I went to student school my last year. My homie Jackson, he was in, like, a punk rock artist, and he put me on a punk show. And other than that, like, I remember one of my first shows in like um, uh, Kensington Market, like uh, there was this place called Anarchist Free Space and we were just like rhyming and like a lot of people showed up, like I don't know, like, I don't know, it was like 30 people or some shit. And then from there, like, um, uh, what was I gonna say? Like it was wild because like 
Anarchist, Anarchist, uh, oh, we got the Twitch? Yeah, 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 my bad, everybody. I'm just setting it up, peanut butter, being being a bad host here. But yeah, go go ahead, Admiral, who we're talking about. What was that, your first, your first show there? Yeah, my first show, so it's like, it was an Anarchist free space, and it was like, the owner was really cool, um, and it was like, uh, my boys punk rock band was playing, then me and my crew Bleach Harmony, which was an auto mix and Ron was. Now we're doing this interview up in Park Lawn. Ron, Ron is from Park Lawn. Uh, Anonymous was from Lakeshore. I was from Rex, and we did a, a crew called Bleach Harmony. And we performed the show there, and that was like, it was just some wild like high school stuff. And then like, what's bugged out is I remember going downstairs, and there was like spoons downstairs. Like I think some of the older punk rock there's we might have been fucking with heroin and shit so that was like one of my earlier shows and then in terms of like opening up for people it's like uh i mean not opening i i opened yeah i opened up for cage and that was great at i think rock pile and that was dope but that's oh, it's almost like getting his crowd right that was that a cage from new york like yeah yeah oh that's big time yeah he's uh, really cool we, we did two tracks together Nice, nice. Yeah, and he's one of my big influences, and it's funny because it's almost it's it's interesting because he's like, he was he's American, but his background is German and half Serbian, and I'm like I was born in Toronto, and my background is I have Germanic roots, but then like Croatian, and Croatian nice, and nice. Serbia they used to like fight, it used to be Yugoslavia, then broke down Croatian and Serbia, and it's like, so in a sense we kind of we have a similar background. But uh, again, we're totally different. He's like far greater MC than I am. He's he's incredible. Yeah, I look up to him. He's incredible. Hey, hey, man, you know you, you ain't that far. I'm telling you, like you've been yeah. putting in work and stuff. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, man. Uh, so so yeah, mo moving right along here. Uh, now now I know uh, guys like me don't do art for the money that comes from from the grind. You know, it's it's mostly about the art for most people, unless you know you went to school. You that kind of like you know professional type like uh you know but uh i know from my research that you fancy yourself a bit of a hustler right right and uh so uh, you you've been biting at the base even in one of your interviews there i i i saw you working at mcdonald's even from a young guy learning how to yeah. hustle there and yeah. stack and everything so my, my question is uh like did making money off of your rap skills ever feel like a potential reality when you started out with with your rap click altered states in the yeah movies? In, in altered states, that was like from Rexdale, Bergamot, right at the Is Islington and Rexdale, where the Walmart is now, and um, the Pinedale buildings, and it was my crew there, it was like um, Last Poet uh, and uh, First Aid, and, and we used to run, we just used to chill in the buildings, like smoking weed, drinking, and just bust freestyles, and uh, then we started recording, um, and you know, uh, it was, we were just rhyming. We weren't really thinking about money because we were kind of like, yo, let's just as like punk rock or whatever, just like making it for the love. But then I realized money is really important anyway. And it's like, you know, I'll, I wasn't given much at all. Like I grew up in Bergamo, Rexdale. It's like, you know, single, single mother home. And then that was Dixon. Then I moved to like Rexdale with my dad. Um, I wasn't get like I, I paid I worked at McDonald's and at a farmer's market and saved enough to go to school come to college for the first time. So nothing was, but then like, I was never really thinking about money, I just wanted to do shows and release music, but then later on I realized that money is really important and cash is really important and, and um, even running a business, they say you have to make enough profit in order to cover your costs so you can keep running the business. So it's like, well, all these people, they're funny, like, oh, look, we're underground, we're independent. And we're not, no, but as soon as I moved out for the first time at 24, I realized that money is very important. Yeah. And I hate to say it, but it's almost like, yeah, there was this underground stuff and it was 97 where it's like Puff Daddy won over Wu-Tang. And I was like, I didn't really like Puff Daddy at all. But then over time, I grew to respect Puffy. Yeah. And then just like six months ago, I was at Young and Dundas and I was hearing some Puff Daddy total remix with Mace. And then I'm like, and I never took to, to, bad boy records much and then i'm hearing it and i'm like it sounds good so it's almost like the stuff that i didn't like like and it's like puffy continued probably because he has the cash and all these underground artists they're talking about shit they're like yeah we do it for the love having 
Like going to studio costs money, clothing costs money, microphone, it all costs money. Yeah. So if you like, lease careers cost like, money, all yeah. that it costs like ten thousand dollars on average to release each independent album, and, and including if you record your own stuff or you do it, you yeah, know, the time, all that, all yeah. that, and it's like if if somebody makes like. Eighteen dollars an hour, and, and you count the amount of time you put into your project, and then all the, the technology and all that. Someone's paying for, it, even if you know people doing that, or paying fifty dollars for a studio, so it counts. So it's like, yeah, people can front on people like Puff Daddy or whatever. They have millions or billions, but then like imagine giving billions or millions to invest to like a punk rock artist, and then their ideas, and then like blowing that up at a crazy scale with good music. So cash counts. I'm for it. Yeah. No, no. I mean, more legit, like true, true to form artists had like enough cash and 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 were like had the wherewithal to invest it in their careers and stuff. Man, we would see some unbelievable things happen in music. But yeah, that's 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 why you know like like there's lots of you know government funded stuff that goes on too. So yeah. gotta be grateful for for that. And you know in Canada and in, in Ontario, I've seen a lot of people do well with those. You, you've been sober for like the last eight years or so now and i wanted to congratulate Thank you on you. that like you're welcome man. and, and I, I know how tough that can be as i you know i was sober for five years straight uh, recently and you know uh, trying to buckle down fix my life and stuff like that and, and and i don't bring this up for no reason right like i bring this up because you gained a bunch of momentum in that time and released two solo hip-hop albums one actually I'm, i might be incorrect you, you i think you released more than two did you not I think because I think I quit in two thousand fifteen, so then to in yeah so I released Death Catch It so Beat a Hope from Montreal and then I released Shadow Sphere in two thousand and nineteen did the joint new track with Cage there, and then I dropped Shadow Sphere, and then I dropped Drop Vegas the film so yeah I dropped and now I'm releasing Nightmare Fuel so that's like four albums and uh, one film. Yeah, yeah, and, and yeah. this guy, like, he wasn't kidding when he said he was a hustler. He diligently submitted that film to, like, Toronto Film Festival and Cannes, you know, made it into a DVD, pushed it with the yeah. same, you know, gusto he pushes his career. So, like, big up. Thanks. Yeah, man. Um, so, uh, essentially, um, you know, many people give up on their artistic efforts, I find, and talents yeah. and stuff. It's hard. Like, you say, cost money. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I think that, like, to get to the point where things move rapidly as, you know, fast as, as, as they do, like, it takes a lot of build-up and a lot of, you know, momentum and stuff like that. And that's where, why I wanted to ask, like, uh, what, what is it like being in the fast lane with the artistry? Because a lot of people don't actually get to this sort of fast-paced level where you're at, where you're, you're yeah. doing thing after you know what I'm saying? And it's cool, but it, almost I don't even look at it as too fast. Like, like in the beginning, 2002, I released two albums in one year, Interviews on the Crew album, and then I, I dropped an album every year up to, like, I think 2007. Then I kind of tapered down, and then I started dropping an album every two years. Um, you know, dropping around two years, and the thing is, is like I'm working on an album the whole year, and it's kind of not a really slow down, but as soon as I was working a full time job, then it's like and dealing with, you know, having an apartment and, and, and real life responsibilities. But the thing is, is like um, I just find that artists with big gaps in their discographies, that's a sign of falling off in a way. If an album, if an artist doesn't drop an album in seven years, it's a problem. And then they come back, it's like oh. So it's like, I know that no matter what, I've got to drop, try to drop an album every two years. And then I'm somewhat relevant still, and yeah. fresh. Because that's really important because then you're staying consistent and um, with the sound and everything. And it's just about kind of like letting the wheel spin in terms of like dropping an album, doing shows, videos, getting lots of views, attention, putting out stickers, and then selling it. And then, and then I'm on, and then I'm in album mode again. And then I'm writing rhymes and stuff but it's like every I, I every every week i try to put like an hour or two hours in so an album gets completed after literally like the consistency of like two hours every week and it's frustrating because it's almost like i love it and then i don't because it's like i can edit a video and then it's like i always put a timer now like so it's like yeah i'll, I'll time myself if whether i'm in the mood or not and it's like oh uh 
two minutes in editing, okay, leave it alone because I don't want to touch that anymore. And then, then when I'm in that zone and I'm like, time it, and it's like an hour and a half, I was in the zone. I, and then when I catch myself in that zone, I just run with it. And I just, because I know those can come rarely. I get that pretty good too because I love hip hop and, and creating so much. But if I don't get that, I kind of force, I always tell people, I don't know what writer block is. I never have writer's block because I, I force it. Unfortunately, like this, there's good when you're like, oh, you're inspired. But even when I'm not, I push because then it's like, oh, now I'm freaked out. I'm not inspired. So I'll be like, oh, this is why I'm not inspired. So it's constant. Yeah. And that's why I'm always doing stuff. And then part of being sober is like, because like, you know, when you quit, I, I, I even I can imagine for yourself, it's like, it's almost like drinking alcohol. That was not that I had a problem with alcohol. I quit alcohol because I just started hating the hangovers and I was unproductive. When I stopped that. Then I realized whenever I got stressed, I wanted to grab a bottle or get a bottle or drink. And then I realized a lot of it dealt with like my fears and my hurt and, and, and my anger, my anger. Admiral Crumple interview. Twenty yeah. scene two. Welcome back. Twenty uh, scene. Yeah, yeah. Twenty scene dot com. Gonna be posted up there soon. So let, let's see, let's see what it is. Yeah, we were talking about uh, uh, how you mentioned you, you had collaborated with Cage, freaking amazing rapper there, yeah. big time New York guy. You know, like and um, yeah, I, I, I feel as if. You you and him are, are you know not only similar in your like dark hardcore rap stylings and your clever rhymes and stuff like that, but also in, in like the care that you take uh, for like your fellow hip hop heads and stuff like that, your fans and stuff like that. Yeah. With the message that you, that you guys put out and the way you carry your, yourself, you know. And I, I read somewhere that you encourage your followers to follow their conscience and build towards their callings. Yeah, and, always. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it's similar to like Cage because he, he connects very deeply with things like mental health, yeah. you know, suicide prevention and stuff like that. I've seen him talk about those kinds of things and like, you know, that's it, that consciousness is, is, you know, an awesome through line between the two of you, especially because you're sort of in the same like wheelhouse um, and you, you even like collaborated with each other. Yeah. I think it, it probably gives a lot of rappers out there like some, some hope you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But my, my question here is, um, like, what struggles slash, you know, trials, tribulations, and stuff like that have you overcome in your musical, artistic, you know, life, and uh, even in the course of your recovery and stuff you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just like growing up in a single-parent home and, like, you know, that, that j and just, like, growing up on, like, heavy metal, punk rock, and then, like, hip-hop, it's, I just feel like, uh hip-hop came from poverty in the bronx and all that right so it's like and first time i saw hit i was introduced to either the run dmc video for walk this way with aerosmith or when i was a child and i got i saw the ghostbusters 2 movie and on the soundtrack you had dougie fresh spirit and he was like spirit some people hear it some people hear it's like old school hip-hop but then like you know growing up and seeing like um like listening to like them like red man and krs1 so it's almost like I, I I was just into hip hop and I my background is I'm not, I wasn't a rich kid growing up but I totally do value money and luckily now I've always worked my whole life full time and and make money off cataphonic productions uh, but the thing is it's kind of like just rapping and then like um, 
uh, just like try, like I think in the beginning um, I didn't I didn't flow on point like some they used to I used to get dissed a lot and then I, then people started getting more respect for me and then I'd listen and I'd learn and then I remember I was in a studio with one of my homies and he said this you're flowing off here and I was like instead of getting angry at him or criticizing I'm like you know what, let me try something and then I I I hit the snares differently. And it just blew my mind and I came back with my verse and he's like, holy shit, like I did an excellent verse. And then I'm like, and I realized where I was hitting the snare wasn't kind of like accurate up till like 2000 and even eight. And, and I was like, fuck, like I was fucking up. But yeah. then, because I was listening to even like, you know, a lot of cool key, then he's offbeat and there's a style, you can do whatever you want in hip hop. Yeah, but really then cool. like, there's a form of music where it should be like hitting snares and all. So then yeah, there's normal hip hop, like it's yeah, fine, it's yeah. cool. And then, and, then when, and then see now I'm going back and I'm listening to like, I was listening to old Cool G rap, like Road to the Riches and Cool G rap, it's like, you think it's grimy hip hop and all this shit, but the way he hits the beat, it's like exacting. It's like musically like perfect. With the, who knows if he got any musical training? I had a a grade five music teacher. He used to talk about how rap is shit and it's not musical. Yeah. And it's like if he only knew no, like the flow and rhythm of like rhyming, it's. Yeah, no, a lot of these rappers were like second generation and stuff like that as far as music goes. So you're you're right to say like there's a lot of like like actual um like theory in in some of these yeah. like beats and ra raps and, and flows and all that so then so it's like and then just like struggling in terms of like uh, like when i used to make beats it's like i have one sample and then flowing into the next or uh the way it would like i, I just like kind of getting my own sound and not wanting to sound like anyone else but pulling influences because it's funny because then even a lot of these rappers that i looked up to like um and uh, like it turns out like they were listening to the same music i was listening to and then it's just like some like necro influenced me a lot of these people but it's like i would never want to sound like them because i'm different it's like they went through what they went through i went through what i went through and i have to talk kind of my truth yeah. but it's like yeah the similarities are there but just like i was thinking about how like rappers wore baseball hats so like, everyone wears like baseball caps but i'm like who was the first one to do that and i'm like looking back and i'm like I don't know, cool Keith on Four Horsemen is wearing like a baseball hat. I like just like finding my artistry and then just like, and then struggles in terms of sobriety. I mean, I don't know, like I just, uh, I, I have I have like generalized anxiety disorder, but I don't take any pills for that. Like I used to have bad panic attacks, but there still it wasn't a year I didn't smoke weed. Like, but I stopped smoking weed for a while because it would trigger panic attacks. But then it still there hasn't been a year where I didn't take a puff or something. But then it's kind of like quitting alcohol and all this stuff. It made more of my, my emotions more intense. So I know how to feel things like head on instead of trying to escape. So that's kind of the struggles. And then just like in terms of like relationship struggles or even like, even like work struggles, like people try to be on point and they can think that they come from challenging home situations, but then you go to school and that can have its situations or even where the workplace can have it. There's no kind of escape from challenges. And like, again, I'm anti-bully too. Like all bullies, they're, they're fucking weirdos. You know what I'm saying? It's gotta be either yeah. teamwork or not. They have that attitude of putting people down and long-term those people never, never pop off long-term. And it actually, they, they stagnate bullies, bullies stagnate. And the thing is about them, they actually, um, you want you watch them get dissed eventually like they're the ones who get disrespected it's like i just try to show love you know what i'm saying so yeah yeah there's a there's this old berber song like from morocco that they say uh, all those who lie will one day face the truth i think it's the same thing with bullies all those motherfuckers who bully one day gonna face the bully you know what i'm saying exactly yeah, yeah. and then they when they hit up against somebody that's Cause even I have a family member who's a tough dude and he can be an asshole. And then I'm like, yo man, did you ever come across someone bigger than you, that you were scared of? Like a dude and he goes, yeah. <laughs> and it just, it just stops there. It's like, what are you going to do now? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it is what it is. All right. So, so moving along, I, I know that like me, uh, you, you have a production outfit. You like to publish and stuff like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and like, uh, I'm excited to, you know, see what more comes out of Cataphonic Productions. Cataphonic. Yeah. And like, uh, in the future, uh, 
as you know, you clearly know what you're doing is what I'm, is what I'm trying to say. And um, that's why I want to ask you, you know, if you can tell me a bit more about the origins and like the mission of, of your label, Cataphonic. Yeah, well, Cataphonic, our mission is to run a conscience active, principle centered, and value driven record label where we where we reap what we sow. We present our creativity and art to the world, and we inspire other people to create. And that's been the mission since 2002. And yeah, like it's about making money, but at the same token, the first thing beyond money is like inspiring art. We are like, damn, because it's like, you know, people don't get really get inspired by the radio too often. You hear an independent track like that one you just played me, that that all, that punk rock track. Yeah, yeah, it was a shoegaze song. It was a shoegaze song by the band Chilldozer. Yeah. They were a 20 scene, uh, the editorial actually. Yeah, and it was a really dope track. And I'm like, that's inspiring. Like, like, and then it's like certain things just inspire, like like a, a record, like an underground record. In the, and there's a lot of good pop music too, but that's kind of like, I try to like, you know, that vibe where you grow up or Michael Jackson, when he was popping off, you're like, wow, he's a superstar or, or Nirvana, Kurt Cobain, or like now, like, okay, like Eminem when he popped off or like Snoop or friggin' um, Tupac or, or like The Weeknd now, it's like, this awestruck where you're like wow like life is more than like art art makes life exciting you know what i mean and and to me there's got to be some period about that like there's got to be like again i'm for certain things like personal responsibility having dreams and vision and, and like loyalty like yeah and yeah. i i think you you know before you said you know you, you try not to bring the same thing to the table as other people but there are you know rappers that, that are somewhat like you and i think that that speaks to like your mission too like you know you you keep it stylistic you know what i'm saying that's a challenge that's hard for yeah, yeah it is but then on top of that yeah you've got priorities even with your with your label and stuff like that it's not it, the money is good and the money is maybe secondary but at the end of the day you keep your priorities straight you stay hip-hop you know? right and i've always seen hip-hop and that's kind of and it's particularly dark hardcore club hip hop like nightmare fuel is like as i say it's almost like a horror movie in audio form this dude kept asking me when I'll find the chick And the funny thing is, his wife's cheating on him It's cataphonic, satanic rap mixed with scripture It's the fuck out of here, I'm too imperious It's the crib kid, it's the kid, crib kid It's like, there's a lot of Toronto rappers and a lot of even chick rappers out there Promoting like, escorting and this, that, and the fucking cash for ass shit And it's like, like that I quit and, and it's funny because whole rap, this thing to like A lot of those girls, they can they can rap and it sounds good And it's like, and he, they want to express in that, but they're not doing it in real life cool but if their message is like yo get money and do this and yeah. they're sending it to girls that's not cool because that's moving away from the family structure and the family structure already is in danger so my thing is and it's funny because i'm a little bit of a hypocrite because like uh, me and my girl we can listen to that shit there's something about yeah, it's like yeah. booty shaking like it's fun sometimes like, yeah. yeah it's funny you right? don't take it's, it too too uh, right hard. And, yeah. and it's funny because i actually think that, like a lot of female rappers are at the forefront like they're they're expressing their anger more so than men now and and, and it's, it's kind of grimier but again it's i don't it, it's i yeah i don't fully support the message and the thing is like i express art if you can express it but like you can't talk about killing someone if you're pissed off but don't do it in real life now you just express it like just like a horror movie yeah but the thing is is like you know there's a lot of even like toronto rap chicks who are about that like on some sex worker life and i'm like i'm so far away from that i'm, I'm talking about shit like teamwork and personal responsibility yeah, and meditation passion, and meditation yeah. and just like and, and 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 like and grimy stuff like just like hardcore but it's like that's, and, and I'm not about trapping and these rappers holding up cash from their face and like flexing on fake cars and everything's running there. They, they come out with a blast one year and then they're gone in, in two years. They're out. I mean, I have a rhyme on my, on my, on the album and I'm like, um, whole rappers from my city aren't it. That rhyme you spit two years ago is why you never lasted. Cause that shit yeah. doesn't last. Yeah. So, yeah. No, you, you're right. And, and, and I think people have to always be kind of aware of what they manifest yeah with it. i mean it might you might you might make money off it sure but you might manifest some fucking like human wreckage and misery and yeah exactly and people don't see the life of that and then my like people are talking about like 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 it's a plus like like and again i don't knock sex workers if it's the last resort someone has 
whether they're d dealing with it or they're getting money off, like, okay, what it is what it is. But ultimately, it's like aim for healthy relationships, aim for health in general regarding that. And the thing is, like, and even coke raps and all this, people talking about that. But this album talks about the reality. Like, yeah, it's all shiny when, when you're talking about it and showing your cars. But the reality is coke dealers, like, like people people are mad at those people or people they have so much drama like like it's crazy like people want to kill people like for real and it's yeah. like and then and then like hoes or whatever they they the health in if detrimental health effects in terms of like yeah it's not for STDs, everybody STDs yeah. or Certainly even not for everybody. even like drugs and then like they're all coked up because you can't handle or heroin all that so it's like the reality paints a different picture and it's dangerous like hookers get murdered like every day around the world like it's in danger of violence so it's like yeah. why you can't why? avoid the reality yeah and it's like that's the thing like cat they, they get consequences so it's like that's why this album kind of like shows like some real shit so it is what yeah. it is yeah yeah so um now i want to go off a little bit more like about your accomplishments here if i can you know admiral crumble He's a live performing rapper, you know, he, you can draw 75 to 100 people to a show, you know, uh, you've sold hundreds of albums in Europe, New York, and Canada alone, with additional followings throughout the Commonwealth, like in Australia, UK, you know what I'm saying, and, and even, you know, as far west as like California State, getting some, some buzz out there too, right? Yeah, that album that you went and made out there. Cali Project, yeah. Yeah, yeah, big ups, like, and so, can you tell me uh, about your favorite like fan followings, I'd love to hear any stories you have about like, you know, any of these like followings that you have that are not necessarily like within the geographic area, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I mean too, like even like with the Cali project, it's like my boy Bammer and Evergreen. And it's funny because long time ago on Facebook, I had my boy Jesse, who was my significant seven. And it's just a trip because he was my boy on, on MySpace. And then I met Bammer and uh, Evergreen separate. And we knew each other just through MySpace, but it was the California connection, but they didn't know each other. And it was so weird because Evergreen told me that, I don't know which way it is, but basically I think Evergreen and Bammer were in a clam chowder place in California. And they were like, yo, check it. Like we're listening to Admiral Crumple. And Jesse, who I know, was like behind them. And we all knew each other separately. And then Jesse just like, yo, you know Admiral Crumple? I know him too. And it was just like, so they kind of met each other because they knew me, but like they didn't know each other. So that was kind of like some weird connection. And then another thing is like, I've been hitting Vegas up to like work on that Drop Vegas film. And then it's like, I, um, in the airport, somebody just recognized me in like Los Angeles. They're like, yo, what up, what? And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, that was great. So things like that, those fan stories, it's, and there's like, you know, they're, they're great moments. Yeah, that's, that's awesome, dude. Uh, I think that's one of, you know, the most rewarding parts of being an artist. Yeah. That sort of stuff. Definitely. Like, yeah, the, the memories, the experiences with the people and stuff like that. Real Wolf opened up for uh, La Coca Nostra. Real Wolf, also West Side rappers and stuff like that. Yeah, and, uh, Tom. Tom from Real Wolf, I know him, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got a resin to sign uh, one, of, one of their albums, actually, which is dope. I'm not sure if that's Tom. I, I only know him as, as resin. Yeah, I think Tom, a resin may be another MC from that label. Yeah, yeah, there's a few of them there. They're, they they do good work, Real Wolf, and, like, you know, um, uh, yeah, I saw them at Hard Luck Tavern a, a few years back, just before the pandemic. Ill Bill was there, you know, White Boy Scummy, a, a bunch of people, a Macro, an Only One putting on, you know, like, it, it was an awesome show. Um, but uh, essentially, you know, uh, I, I wanted to mention it because, um, you know, it, it's... It reminds me of your style, like La Coca Nostra, uh, Ill Bill, stuff like that, and 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 um, you know horrorcore is 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 big, and and like I know a lot of people are into it these days, and it's it's really evolving, yeah. um, and and I got like really sort of tight beats like that from 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 your production, and, 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 and you know like uh, you're you're fine tuned, and I think you know. Um, that that's that's awesome, but then like uh, uh, I managed to to dig up uh, some of your some of your albums here. You have quite a few, and I think we narrowed it down to like you have you have uh, 16, 16. 16 albums with a seventeenth coming out, mm. and then there was like what four of them four of the 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 sixteen albums are are uh, uh, 
crew album. Crew album. Yeah, and and the, the other twelve are, are are you know solo. That's that's that, that's impressive, man. Yeah. Uh, so my question here is, uh, can you shout out like any beat makers? Now I know now that you you do most of your own production, but anyone maybe you've worked with uh, uh, in that regard, or or you know, uh, and as well like I guess. Uh, tell me what you feel like sharing about that the usual creative process for your for those albums. Well, yeah, like shout out like West Nile produced a lot on like the next night in Sorcera. Um, he produces uh, and then Altarba. He's from France. I was working with him, um, but again, like I I produced a lot. Um, I I produced I think. Since 2002, I was always like the main producer on my stuff, and then there was offshoots like where I was like really working with like West Nile and um, Al Tarba. Those are kind of the main ones. But yeah, but like shout out Real Wolf. I know you mentioned him, and like with his video work, it's like Tom. I know him. I'm actually in one Real Wolf video, the D12 one. No. I go off, and it's like I was there in, in in one of the videos. I play like a fiend all hooded up, and then like some guy comes and like oh, tries dude. to kill us. It's, yeah, and, and he's definitely, Tom's definitely doing his thing, and um, I wish him the best and everything like that. And it's like, yeah, you get all this, like, there's Real Wolf, and then I have Cataphonic Productions. And yeah, Westside's well, doing good, man. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. Yeah, but, like, uh, the creative process, though, on, on those albums, can you can you go, like, whatever you want to share about that. Yeah, like, creatively, there's a method, it's like, the around. method is kind of like, again, if I'm ever really upset about something, I'll just write it. And then it's, like, just producing, like, I'll, I'll just play around with some keys or I'll, I can even hum like a beatbox and then make a beat but then it's like I'm always searching for samples like I'm always going through samples I used to take out CDs classical CDs from the library and then or even if I hear a movie or, or like a weird interview on YouTube and then like I'll, I'll be like oh that's a sample we used to joke about yeah, that right? yeah. so like, oh that's a sample no I did that, that. That's a at, sample at the beginning of 20 scene 2 episode 1 I, I sampled a uh, uh, it was Malcolm X being interviewed. If you, yeah. if you can hear this, this something about personality uh, or something, that was that was a Malcolm X interview. Yeah, mm -hmm. and like uh, yeah, I like all the samples, the sound effects you have in your stuff, and all. Yeah, that then you and especially use a lot of samples. Like I mean, like sound effects, as in like 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 gunshots and like slices, like and but but even like. Um, my creative process again, like I'll make a beat, I'll cook up a beat, and then I'll write to the beat, and then I'll record it, and. And then even when I record all this, well, first of all, I'll record it on my phone to get the flow right. And when I record, I live with the tracks. I put it on my phone and I'm like, oh, shit. Like, then I pick a part. I'm like, that needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I have to go back and make a part tighter. And it's just a constant working. Every week, it's just like hours I put in in the week until it, it just the body work starts building. And like, now this album's done. I'm just doing one more track. Um, and it's a collab. Uh, that I'm kind of keeping on the wraps for now, but it's, it's a surprise collab. Um, uh, and then, and then, like you know, the album cover, and then, and it's just, it's just like constant work, and it's just like video edit footage. Like you're, you're dealing with all this stuff, and then all of a sudden it's done, and you're like, oh man, I, yeah. I got a product now, and then, and it's so satisfying. Awesome. So it's, it's like kind of like consistent work, like it's almost like a jumbled mess. With with like a, a lot of like on point stuff even in the beginning, but then it's just fine tuned, and then I just kind of stop, and I'm like cut, release it, cut, yeah, release it to the masses. Yeah, because there's only so organized you can get like prepping beforehand, yeah, and during and stuff. And yeah, it eventually it just becomes an amorphous thing, and you, you exactly like you said, you just have to tie it up as and, quick, and throw yeah. it out there because then that's the thing. Because a lot of people that even in Rex, so they never end up dropping your stuff because. They're really scared. And I'm like, you know, what? I'm gonna throw it out there, and then if people hate it, I'll, I'll learn from it. But I expose myself. I'm like, here you go. Here's it. And then, and then, like, let me get that feedback. And then, and then, and then, that's how it is. And then, I'm learning. Well, as opposed to just hoarding the stuff, and then never releasing it. And then these people like release, and then they get really scared. So, it's being an art uh, artist is is a, uh, it's a. Uh, it's it can be challenging, but it's a, a a great thing. Yeah, I mean, and and, and you you know you you wear it well. Uh, it, it is definitely like one of the most like anxiety ridden kind of like 
careers to have. Yeah, I guess yeah. especially if you, if, if, if you get anxiety from people and like you know uh, uh, that kind of thing, like what happens, what people say about you when you're not around, and that kind of thing. Oh but, yeah, but then that's what I'm saying is like it's it's it shows it shows your strength of character. I, I heard recently some people like from like. Uh, an old workplace were like talking crap about me and I'm like and even about my music and I was shocking because these people I thought they were, they were friends and then I hear this and then and then it's kind of like but then when I look deeper they kind of either quit or their own dreams were severely underdeveloped and this is like people I actually went up to and uh, helped like I'm like yo go for yours do your thing and they kind of stopped and instead of working on their stuff they're disrespecting me or talking me behind my back and, and I'm far away from those people or whatever and, and I, hey I wish them the best but it's like when I see where I grew to from there I have so many more albums I've you know like like more cash or whatever more better experiences and I'm just like I feel like going for your goals and, and dreams opens life up and opens good stuff and it's like if if somebody cuts down someone's dreams those people that, that that's they're they're in for their own horror movie yeah yeah so, so, i hey, mean hey i wish them the best though like whatever hey 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 pe people are out there living you know what i'm saying after they get ripped off by motherfuckers or like you know people treat them like crap and stuff like that you never you never understand that there's a lot of people out there seething just you know waiting for because you know it is a dark world. Like yeah. I think your album reflects that and stuff. But but you also have the notion of like you know it comes full circle and stuff. Right, like and it comes back to like inspiration and love at the end of the day because underneath all my again nightmare feels an angry album and a lot of rappers aren't even expressing their anger. So it's like it's an angry album, which to me I feel is rare in two thousand twenty three. But underneath that is my hurt and fear, and underneath all that is my love. You know what I'm saying? And my love for hip hop and my love for music. And and like we're chilling, love, and it's all blessed and freaking, you know, going to shows, art, fashion, and that that's what it's really about. Yeah, yeah. So uh, moving right along here. Um, so a lot of what what started what I do online creatively with 20c.com and stuff um, stems from a series of poems I wrote with a typewriter after injuring my hand accidentally in the kitchen before writing the Ontario paralegal P1 licensing exam. And um, I find your story particularly inspiring and see you as somewhat of a trailblazer, you know, um, just because I was in recovery uh, at, at around the same time you were, but you were like uh, that you, you still are, and you were about a year ahead of me at the time, um, and and so like uh, I just um, you know I wanted to, to to first you know thank you for for sort of creating a, an atmosphere for for artists in recovery and stuff like that. Which yeah, I, I think you did, and uh, uh, I just uh, yeah like I wanted to talk about. Uh, um, how you, you you had mentioned somewhere that you you, you like writing short stories, uh, you know, poetics and prose and that sort of thing, um, and it's fascinating to me what happens with um, artists when they transition into and out of recovery and how you know that affects the paradigms and dynamics involved and what have you. So, like, my question is, uh, would you would you tell us about? Your favorite writers, publications, poets, you know, what does Admiral Crumple like to read? Source or Double XL, you know? Yeah, I used to buy Source magazines. Uh, I, I have the Snoop Dogg one when he was dog father from 96, I think. Um, Source, I used to buy that. I used to buy Double XL magazine. I remember in high school, like going to like a rabbi and there was the the friggin double xl with raekwon and his gold tarantula chain and i'm like that's so dope and i never ended up buying it i always wanted that photo and then i found the photo online but double xl was dope source but in terms of writing that's the thing i always wanted to be a writer as a kid i wanted to be a writer i i liked books i liked children's books i liked i think what lois lowry that book the giver or something i don't know the yeah giver. yo that book is intense yeah and little kids reading it and it's yeah, like, it's about a like trip. a cult and like it's yeah. cut off from society yeah and, and i and i got like this hardcover version and even like i like i'm, I'm a fan of like box art oh and like this the, the art is, there's say hi to misty misty say hi to your fans 
I love cats. Shout out cats. They were on Instagram. <laughs> so basically, um, what it is is like that book, even like the, the, the cover was like like a matte finish and then like a shiny one that got a hard. So like I, I always like books, but in terms of authors, I love Aldous Huxley. Like he did, um, uh, one of my favorite books by him is Ends and Means. And it's just, he, even in the book, he says it's a cookbook of all, like, one, it's a bunch of essays. So it's like, one chapter is war, another one is society, and then it's like, war part two, and then another one is education, another one is religion. And it's, he's just, all those talks, he's one of my favorite authors. And then, um, it's funny, because I also read a lot of hardcore business. I'm, I'm reading the biography of Sam Walton in Walmart. I think he was a great man. Like, he just created a whole... Uh, empire with Walmart and he lived like well over 80 years old married to one woman his whole life so business business books and like even the guy who ran General Motors like Alfred Sloan like that inspires me like these corporate dudes who actually have somewhat of a conscience and they're creating stuff that benefits society yeah like I don't know if you we were talking about McDonald's earlier if you watched the movie about uh, the guys that started McDonald's. Croc. I mean, what was it? Was it, that? It was just like the Ray the, Kroc, but the, the president the, or the owner, the, the owner, owner, the owner. Yeah, I saw. Wow, that. that was he's really dope. Cool. Yeah, that was a trip. Like, and it's about Ray Kroc. Like, yeah, like business. It's it's an interesting thing. Yeah, man. So, um, I just um, so so we're gonna we're gonna transition from here to talk about um, you know, uh, some of the, the Nightmare Fuel album a little bit more, just because, uh, you know, Admiral Crumple was kind enough to, to give me a listen while he was here. It hasn't even come out yet. I know y'all are jealous. Exclusive. Uh, 20 exclusive. exclusive. Uh, yeah, the benefits no, of a not-for-profit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, uh, um, that, like, uh, the Red Hot Chili Peppers in their song, Can't Stop, called music the great communicator and and, and i find it uh spiritual in that music uh, so i feel there is something intangible about the message of hip-hop and, and you know collaboration has been key since the beginning when you consider musical concepts like call and response uh, drawn from like church choirs and, and utilizing hip-hop you know uh, i guess my final question here is a bit of a shout out to you know 50 years of hip-hop you know um, this year is 50 years. I've been into it for about 20, and, and, I, and I'm grateful for every minute of it, you know? Um, but uh, So my question here is, what rapper slash music video editor slash industry juggernauts can you shout out off the top of your head uh, before we move on to Nightmare Fuel questions? Just, just pipe off if you remember. Off the top, I like, I mean, um, even in terms of music video and artistic quality, I mean, Capadonna, his run video is incredible. Um, I'm just trying to think of hip hop videos that are dope. Capadonna's run, a lot of the old Wu Tang videos like Cream were dope to me. Um, and then, but then even beyond hip hop, like Nirvana's uh, Heart Shaped Box video is incredible. Uh, and then again, like, um, Mob Deep videos by, by uh, Hype Williams. Yeah. And so, so certain, you know, like there's a lot of that. But then in terms of industry, I mean, definitely Nas. Nas is the dude now because look what he did. He did that uh, Hip Hop 50 show and he brought out Run DMC as a headliner and he brought yeah, he some OG up. rap. Yeah. Nas is a, what Nas is doing right now in terms of his this run with uh, King's Disease 1, 2, and 3 and Magic 1, 2, and 3. He dropped six albums in three years. Yeah. That's a lot of work. And it's like, while a lot of rappers just kind of stopped and tapered off, he, he's doing mass appeal. And, and like Nas, this is, it's, it's just weird because people do these things like hip hop's like a young man's sport. And then Jay-Z came out with Blueprint that kind of, that was kind of to me where I thought it was like, okay, now rap, this is a mature rap album. Now adults, this is our yeah, adults. Yeah, yeah, you're right because that's when all the like high end uh, car uh, companies started getting. Yeah, yeah, and then it's like okay, now we're adults and we're out to pay people for their And, and, and yeah. so now Nas is like, it's incredible what he's doing with the the, the an incredible video is um, that one ASAP Rocky and Nas joined on Magic. 
Um, yeah, and, and you know, like, so, like, Nas to me is somebody like, like, he's, again, like, me creating all these two years, it's consistent work. I have a full-time job, so it's kind of like, I have to be super disciplined with time. But it's, but it's a lot of work, and that's one album every two years. Nas did six albums in three years. So while a lot of old rappers are hating people or they're dissing people online and they haven't dropped an album in seven years, nine years, whatever, those six albums, Nas worked hard on it. I can tell you that much. Like, yeah, yeah he probably has big money and access. Like, he could chill in the studio and he could record. Like, he has access to studio. Yeah, he probably has more resources but writing rhymes and recording is work yeah so yeah. he worked hard like i bet anything he was cooped up in the studio for that as those two years oh yeah like it's not it's not like oh yeah i'm chilling for like six months and then recording like he was probably in the studio and because of that that's why he's relevant and Nas is he's just doing something else now man Yo, uh, what? Ah! What? This is the, what you gonna say? Peanut butter come through all day. What? What? Is what they say when you try to step to a dude that play like QKP peanut butter one, two. To your dog and you know I stay true. Take that shit, put it on your tombstone. And I don't give a shit, I'll take the hat off your dome. But yeah, um, so now we're gonna move on and we're gonna talk about Nightmare Fuel. Um, and so, like, um, you, you typified uh, the, the new unreleased album, Nightmare Fuel, as, as your most uh, hardcore hip hop album yet. And I, I will say the Nightmare Fuel album cover looks uh, a, a bit more serious and focused, which is not surprising. Um, as this will be your sixth, uh, uh, actually more than that, I was, I was mistaken at that point, but uh, it, it will be one of many uh, uh, and your latest studio quality album. Um, and, and like, uh, yeah, so it's, it, what I'm saying is that it, it's great that there is so much intention and sophistication that you bring to your albums. Thank you. Uh, it, you you're growing constantly and, and it definitely shows uh, uh, your many years of experience exploring your creativity in hip hop. Uh, my, so my, my first question about Nightmare Fuel is uh, about the album cover. Um, that building looks familiar. How, how would you describe uh, the photo you use there? Well, it's an old vintage building in Toronto and it's a kind of creepy old building. And I just, I, I took a photo of that building. Yeah, it looks like an insane asylum or something. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's a really old building in like downtown Toronto. And, uh, it's just, I took it and then I took the other picture of me at home. It's funny because I'm rocking the same gear on it to show, I guess, the consistency yeah, yeah, yeah. of whatever. And then I just made it black and white. And I mean, that, you know, it's, it's kind of like almost like a Dracula's castle type thing, like the tower and like, uh, you know, dark. It's great. And then uh, the tag, though, the actual Admiral Crumple Nightmare Fuel. Admiral Crumple, that text is my logo but the nightmare fuel tag damn like i went back a lot trying to perfect that it was challenging yeah. and then it's funny because i mean that's in color it's like blue and green or turquoise yeah no it reminds me of like a, a you know uh crust punk like in uh, they're not crust punk like uh, uh what, are, what are those those guys that they do like the minute and a half songs and the uh, grindcore it yeah, reminds yeah, me of like yeah. the grindcore and death metal like a uh, uh uh, like band names that they put on their like, like yeah stuff on their albums and their t-shirts man yeah yeah you get you're getting like to that level with the with the with the hand styles there which is dope. yeah and you're a graffiti artist as well i noticed yeah. all this stuff and yeah yeah i even throw up like like i'm i'm, I'm we out threw up that stuff we did the twitch interview yeah, we collab yeah. that's our art collaboration yeah thing. i mean i try i try not to throw it out there all the time but you can even go on my instagram and see like i have my character kareem abdul jafar i did it under the bridge it just up the street over yeah. there you know, like that's I, yours as well. Yeah, no, that's that's a friend of mine. That that, that guy inspired my uh, uh, like want to do zines. Oh like, right, 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 yeah, yeah. He's an old roommate of mine. He did a a, a zine called Do Batter. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like a, 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 I'm just uh, trying to get us back on on track here. But um, yeah, no, that building. Yeah, it was an album cover and stuff like that. It was very very. Um, 
And that took a Dark. lot of time. It's, it's, yeah. That thing at Out Chicago took like over like ten hours, just like getting it right. And over time, like it's it's a chat. Like things can look simple, but it takes a takes a t- takes time. Does this ha- album have any uh, new references or like? you know, thematic connections to like Toronto, Rexdale, and, and Bergamot, because I, I know you're from... Oh, yeah, yeah, because there's that one track where I'm like, I'm seeing some like, want to flip the script, but they do not know, from Rexdale to Lakeshore to downtown Toronto, so it's kind of like uh, representing that stuff, like the, those areas, and, you um, know, I, I just... I'm way different than any Toronto rapper. Like I am left field. Like you know, there's a lot of rappers in Toronto, but I like to separate myself from everyone. My, my, like as I said, Nightmare Fuel is a horror movie in audio form. Like when you're, when I was a kid and I would and I would see the VHS uh, VHS boxes of like Child's Play or Friday Thirteenth or like Shocker, Halloween, Halloween or. Um, you know, Friday Thirteenth, the Nightmare on Elm Street, like just just the box art of those, like whoa, like so that's like how I like to talk about, like like what my music is in terms of that. It's just it's horror, it's like, like a T dot horror. Yeah, movie. yeah, yeah. And, and even like shout out to the old VHS stores like Video Ninety Nine, Jumbo Video, and yes. Video Madness or Movie Madness in Rexdale. Hey, Sonic and Boom's still around too. Oh right? yeah, yeah. And then even there's another. Like, there's another rental store out of town. It's tough. Like, I mean, but I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Actually, any any venues in Toronto you want to shout out? I haven't played for a minute, but Lola, Lola Bar, I'm in Kensington. And then, you know, right at Bath, there's something Rude Rabbit or something. I don't know if people have shows there still, but it used to be called Q Bar, right in the corner of Bathurst and Queen. And we used to do enough shows there. Yeah, yeah. Because of the pandemic, a lot of these venues are are gone. So I wanted to ask you that. Um, uh, Is there a music video in the works for a a single off this album or something? Yeah, it's already shot and it's being edited. Nice. And uh, it's yeah, uh, it's it's gonna come out shortly when ready. But it's 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 it was shot downtown Toronto and it's it's being edited now. What kind of rap? slash hip-hop fan would this album appeal to again like anyone who likes like boom bap and hardcore hip-hop and like you know is a fan of like uh just like hardcore hardcore hip-hop what was the motivation behind this album again it was it was like cathartic in terms of like if I was so pissed at someone, like I wanted to freaking murk them instead of doing it, just express it, kill them in audio form, and then forgive them, and then just keep living, you know what I'm saying, with health and all that, because why commit a crime when you could just uh, express your, I expressed my anger, got rid of all the negative emotions, got back, and then forgiveness, because ultimately at the end of the day, like Nightmare Fuel, there's a big theme of forgiveness. The, the Nightmare Fuel track, in the end, it's all about forgiving everyone and then just moving on. So I had all this, like, you know, anyone I was hurt, that I felt hurt me or freaked me out over the last two years, I expect my concerns is that, you know, and then just, like, it's just cathartic. And, and it's, it's, there's a lot of truth and facts on the album. And then, then hip-hop-wise, just experimenting with, like, uh, break beats because I, I just like break beats. It, it's it's I always did, but now it was like just like a new fascination. Would you like to shout out any features, producers, or collaborators who took part in this album? Um, well, I've I've kind of got a collab that's I don't want to mention just yet, but people will know when when it's it is ready. But uh, other than that, I mean, I um, I you know just. Uh, shout out like uh i mean i produce all the tracks on it but i you know like shout out to yourself and 20 scene hey for sure and, you could uh, be. shout out like my girl uh, uh vanessa and you know and then even just like just really like um the rappers i was inspired by continue to be inspired like harris one Nas, again like cool g cool cool g rap cool keith i love cool keith and um, just just that, and then even like um, some hip hop books. I think 
I got this book. It said some little liner notes, and it shows like it, the first edition of the book was something about Rakim, think Rakim, whatever. There's a bunch of they interviewed all these rappers about how they created their their albums, and and then the second one is something else. Like it's liner notes about and like they interview Redman and all that. So all these like I don't know, just just. A lot of authors and for you in like photographers and hip hop, I I love that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, does this album have any direct or particular and sort of dominant thematic connection to Toronto, Rexdale, Bergamot, or is it uh, just your usual uh, rap references and stuff that you make? Yeah, it's just usually you know because that's where I'm from, uh, and then. Like again, like grew up in Dixon and Islington, and then had the Rexdale influence, and then moved to Rexdale when I was fourteen to like twenty-seven or. Whatever. That was that little crumble interview, everybody. We had some technical difficulties happen there, but you know we kept it one hundred. You know. And so I wanted to give a shout out to Admiral Crumple, Big Ups, and, and, and Cataphonic, uh, you know, everybody out there uh, from, from his world and stuff like that. Big Ups for supporting this guy. Great talent. Um, you know, so there's going to be a new 20 Scene Tube episode. This interview will be part of it. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I just uh, support hip hop, man. You know, 50 years, support hip hop. Get out there, you know, and, and enjoy it too, right? Lots to love there. And, and for sure, enjoy20scene.com, right? Get out there, say what up, uh, and, and, and you know, comment, like, subscribe. Uh, yeah, and Admiral Crumple, well, it's Crumple1, at Crumple1, uh, on Instagram. You can add him up there. Uh, and yeah, stay blessed, everybody. Peace out.